TGIF, everybody. Hope everyone had a good week. Huh? Everyone have a decent week. Hello, Brock, Sinatra, Rena, Shahab, all my trading warrior brothers and sisters. Kevin, how are you? We have a special day lined up for you guys. Okay. So let's take a look around. A couple of significant things did occur in the markets yesterday I want to touch upon. Uh, we could start here with USD Canada. So I had this discussion with Grega and I talked about it yesterday, this uh, falling wedge in USD CAD and we went right there, okay, and turn. We haven't broken out of the wedge, but uh, put in a nice little reversal week, okay? Didn't get a two week reversal. You can't, oh, all right, how about now? So here was the look yesterday when we were talking and I, you know, I was saying that uh, could we have a falling wedge here and uh, ask Greg if it was an ending diagonal. He said, no, he didn't see five, but it was a wedge and really uh, paid off to probe it down here. I, I've been talking about 125 to the Eagles for a long time and everything. And, you know, we're not getting the break out of the wedge, but should that happen, uh, we could go, you know, to the top of the wedge, 133. So, you know, with that happening, I can't ignore what happened uh, in the dollar. And really interesting how the dollar actually did hold. Yesterday's low was 78.6 from the low we put in uh, back in early January from the 89.20 level. Now you have to say we have a higher low. And we actually got a two-week reversal here. See the reversal candle and we're above the close from two weeks ago. Um, I, if we get over uh, this level, 9140, 92, I know it still has some work to do, but I still think there's plenty of bears to squeeze. I think it might be invalidated now. I don't know what his invalidation point is. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't want to be short the bottom. Yeah, I think we have a, that's part of this scenario, right? So the other thing I pointed out, and this was my best trade of the week, was uh, uh, the night before last, remember I pointed out that my two-week off number was uh, 39.40, and we got up to 37.60, and Got some shorts off at 35. Um, it was Wednesday night, and I said I'll give it a couple of days, uh, risking the high and see if it closes over the off number. And that certainly did not happen. Okay, so this was a big trade. I didn't get all 130 handles, but I got a nice piece of it covered right around here. And I know people are thinking this is a double bottom. Uh, I don't think so. In fact, look at the character from this low. We got uh, really an, a pin bar before this rally. Now what are we doing? We're just consolidating the losses from yesterday. Okay, so that's all we're doing here. Um, and finally, can I say finally? Um, this was a, I, I took a loss and then I got back in and making some money on the short side of crude, which ties into, you know, some of the, you know, NOC and, and definitely CAD. So uh, that's my week. It, it started off pretty lousy because I was early in the pound. But you know what? I just kept firing. And, you know, I had a hard time doing that uh, for many years in my career. Okay, um, you know, I, I, if I took a loss, it would take me a few days to, you know, get composed again, to consume, uh, to assume risk. And, and now I just uh, take what I teach to heart. And uh, the most important word for traders is next. Win, lose, or draw, next is your key word as a trader. And how to be, yeah, I like that, Sansi. And uh, talking about someone who um, really lives it, uh, I'm looking forward to interviewing Blake. 
I'm <laughs> looking forward to interviewing Stell too. So Blake, you want to? Hey, do hey. I, I, I'm left out, out of the equation here. What, what's wrong? What's wrong with hey, you? Hey, Steve's back. Uh, well, I'll interview you. <laughs> okay, Steve, your first question is, uh, are you using the bedpan? <laughs> I, I bet. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you asked for it, buddy. Anyway. <laughs> How are you feeling, buddy? Magnificently, never better. <laughs> okay. All right. Look, look, this guy doesn't stop working no matter what is going on in his life. So uh, glad no, to hear your voice. Steve. These, these days I stopped working and yeah, I <clears throat> they can beat you, both your uh, backgrounds. What do you say? So, what background? What I Trader Summit? What huh? Yeah. Trader Summit? How's my video coming through? Do I look cool? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, there he is, see? Great. So, you know, everyone's been asking about you too, Steve. Where's Steve? Where's okay. Steve? For, for full disclosure, Steve is at the hospital because Steve, for some miraculous way, manages at the age of 40 to get a pneumonary embolism. It's Greek term, pneumonary embolism, it's called, yeah. So we don't know why I survived it, which is, you know, Good, I'm assuming. My wife thinks so, at least. <laughs> um, <laughs> we all think so. Yeah, so um, I should be fine uh, over time. Uh, and I should be out of the hospital in well, it's been next really week nice. at some you know, point. Stelios and I have had an opportunity to um, say a few things while you've been gone. So that's that's been good. Yeah, you see. <laughs> Although, Steve, they keep pausing for no reason because I guess they're expecting to be interrupted. So, uh, you everything know. happens for a reason. There you go. Well, well Steve, yeah. you know, don't get happen. your hopes up because uh, supposedly, if everything goes well, they should be letting me go by third, by Tuesday. So, you know, you have just a few days to get it out of your system, guys. Yeah. Okay, bye. Well, <laughs> Uh, I was going to say that's, you know, it's mo that that guy's is dedication to the Forex analytics family. You got Steve with an embolism that's actually broadcasting from the hospital, uh, wanting to say hello to everybody. So indeed, awesome. and to listen to Stelios' interview. <laughs> yeah, we don't care about Blake. It's about me. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. All Today right. is so, day. <laughs> I, you know, Steve, uh, we're all we're all rooting for you to come home and be, you know, Healthy. I should be okay, coach. All right, so you know it's a it's a little heaviness uh, for us because you know we're a little different than just uh, <clears throat> being in business together. Uh, it's really uh, kind of unique uh, that uh, even though some of us haven't really met in person, that uh, we consider each other important in our lives and the friendships as important as the business, and so. Uh, Come home soon, Steve. Indeed. I should be back on Tuesday, Coach. Thank you. Okay, buddy. So, okay. Uh, let's let Blake talk about the markets, yeah. because let's be honest. The okay, markets have finally started looking like they're giving giving us some interesting days, right? Yeah. Right, Blake? Yeah, yep, it does. Um, actually, the... Um, uh, the, the markets have actually taken a pretty good turn. We, you know, I, I'm going to, I'll pull up the charts really quick here. And uh, let me just go over to, all right. So here's, um, here's, here's the Aussie. I, you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about the Aussie because I actually got limited out of the Aussie at 77.50, like pretty much where we're at, L just a little bit lower. Um, just as I was drinking, I was getting my first cup of coffee this morning about two hours ago. Um, it was right through here, limited out. And then, you know, we've, we've been stabilizing. And just as Dale said, we are stabilizing after a pretty big move. And, uh, you know, if you look at the 161% extension of, you know, the last leg that we had, that's just, you know, it's, we're just finding support here. And, and I have a bunch of FIB levels here just because it's showing you the extension that we stopped at the 161% extension. I'm going to remove that right now. Okay. Then this was a 200 and, or uh, excuse me, that's, this is the pullback. So you can see the pullback now is, is at the 618 retracement, which comes in around 7740. 
My opinion is we're probably going to stabilize somewhere around here. Um, you know, are we going to, um, are we going to go, you know, further lower? I, I do think so. I actually think that the, the Aussie has actually turned, but remember we have a few things ahead of us right now. Like we have the stimulus package that might get passed over the weekend. Um, you know, you might get some buying and buyers stepping in ahead of that. That's just something to be thinking about going into, um, you know, the next, you know, 24, 48 hours. And we've had, we've had re a really big move. I mean, if, if you look at like some of these cross rates, like the Euro Aussie, I mean, that is a, that's a 400 pip move uh, right into previous support acting as current resistance. And, you know, you had the S and P's that came down right to, we're, we're actually right at ascending wedge support. So that, you know, just a lot of, a lot of, a lot of levels to be really careful at. And, you know, I, I do think that, you know, copper is pulling back it. And, and by the way, I don't need to go too far into, um, I don't, I don't have to go too far into uh, uh, the analysis because just about 12 hours ago, I was uh, chatting with Pepperstone Securities, Chris Weston. Um, did you guys see that video? Um, did, did you guys, uh, you guys at home, did you guys get an opportunity to see that video? uh he, it was posted i i tweeted it this morning where's the damn chat box hold on let me see if for some reason i can't find my chat box stand by i have no idea where it's at i, I don't know how to use the zoom thing but anyway they can also find it on our youtube channel very easily Oh, okay. So we, we well wherever it's at you guys i i mean i literally just filmed that i filmed it had dinner with the family uh, went to sleep and it was, it was out, you know, a couple hours later, he had it, it, their editors put it together. So it was pretty nice. Anyway, um, that gives you a pretty good overview of how I feel about the market. So if you want to really get, you know, dive deep into it, there, that's that. Um, but today we have a really interesting interview with Stelios and, and, and I don't want to take away from that, but I do want to give you guys, uh, it was, we kind of, coined it as a dual interview because Dale's here and Dale was going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, about, uh, you know, kind of question me on a few things. Um, but I wanted to tell you guys that uh, I've recently made a really big shift in my life over the last few weeks. Um, for those of you that have known me for years, uh, I've traded for Gellos Capital and prior to that, um, um, well, what, I, I morphed into Gellos Capital about two years ago. This is part of the interview. Huh? This is part of the interview. Oh, yeah. This is part of the interview. Oh, well, yeah, you're, you're interviewing. Anyway, but um, All right, you could uh, just but, talk. But I, but I wanted to, I want to kind of give everybody, you know, an update on um, what I've been doing for the last several years. So for the last several years, I got <laughs> recruited to trade for a firm out of Florida and, um, and, uh, you know, we, we interviewed uh, Ronnie Schlapfer, who, who had his, uh, you know, he was on the BBC, um, uh, the, the um, Billion Dollar Day, if you ever saw that video. We interviewed him. He was, he was the one that found me. And uh, I traded for basically their group for the last four and a half, five years. And um, over the last, was it, I guess, three weeks ago, three weeks ago or so, uh, I officially ended my time with Gellos. Well, we did. It was more of a, it was more of a mutual thing. And um, there's a bunch of reasons for it. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it for a little bit. Um, and if you guys don't know my, my past career uh, trading, you, there's a, there's a great interview that Chat with Traders did. Um, Aaron from Chat with Traders did uh, with me years ago. It was probably about 10 years ago. And it gives you a lot of my background. Anyway, let me first of all start by saying trading for Gellos was probably, for me, not coming from the banking industry or the broker. I, I, I worked as a broker, as a stockbroker, but actual being on Wall Street, working on a trade desk or in, in London like Stelios, which we'll talk about that here in a second. I'm sure Stelios is listening in because uh, we have you know, talk, talking about coming from a pedigree of trading with big size for a bank, 
that's not me. I've always been a retail trader, although I've done really well as a retail trader. It's I've always traded retail, if you will, you know, and I've never traded for a bank. So it was a really big jump for me um, nearly five years ago to trade for it was actually Spectrum uh, was the name of the firm. Um, when I w jumped over to Spectrum, you know, years ago, nearly five years ago, and started trading for them. Uh, I was trading big size uh, compared to what I was norm or was used to trading. You know, when you trade like Normally, like uh, like for me, it was like a hundred thousand in currency or two hundred thousand in currency. When you start trading two to five million in currency, that's ten times the amount. So that's ten times the amount of gain, ten times the amount of loss. But it's a little bit bit different ball game. Ball game, and it has been quite a ride. I've really enjoyed, and I really would never uh, take back what I what the experiences that I got over the last you know five years with them. And the, the, the levels of professionalism and the macro outlooks that, that I learned from these guys, second to none. Um, and, and I enjoyed it. There are a few things that I didn't. And I'm gonna, I wanna explain to you what those are. Um, for me, you know, I'm not, I'm almost 50. I'm, I'm in my late 40s. I'm almost 50 years old. I spent the last five years not sleeping a full night, ever, ever. I mean, you know, minus a Saturday or Sunday, I might have squeezed in a five or six hour sleep at night. But for the last five years, I've literally slept three hours, get up for an hour or get up, look at quotes, go back to sleep for another hour, get up, look at quotes, get up, and then six hours passed, I get up and I start working again. And then I'm in front of my computer literally for the next 15 to 16 hours. You know, some people have a easier time, I guess, trading. And, and I'm basically what I was doing is, is, is like trading for a, a trading prop proprietary, right? But it's not trading for a prop firm because when you trade for a prop firm, you're trading for a firm and you know, it's like a, you know, maybe, maybe a group of investors or something. You don't even know who they are. You know, you're, you're trading proprietary and you're, and, and at that point in time, you're just like, oh, screw it. It ain't my money. I'm just going to, you know, I'm just trading, you know, I don't care, you know, if I make or lose money, I'm, you know, I'm just going to go for it. But when you actually trade for somebody that, you know, and you really, really like them, and you you truly care about them. You meet their family. You know, you know everything about them. Well, it's a different, it's a different ball game. You know, if I, Stelios could probably confirm this. You know, you trade for a bank, and we were talking about, you know, what what's a what's a what's a what's a good day, and I'll I'll just kind of take the words out of his mouth and put them out there for you. You know, we were having this discussion. He's like, yeah, if I if I you know, was it a million dollars still? So a good day. Basically, yeah, a good day or a bad day? Well, basically anything less than 100,000 is noise. And, uh, you know, a good day would be, yeah, between half a million and one million, yeah. Okay, and that, you know, that's trading for a bank. Look, if I traded for a bank and the numbers really didn't matter and it's like, it's the bank for crying out loud, I would be just balls to the wall. I don't care, right? But when you're trading somebody for somebody you know, man, it's different. It's like, for me, it was like trading my grandma's money or something, you know, I, although I don't, my grandma's both have passed away, but it was, it'd be, it'd be something like that. Like, like, uh, you know, I lose 20 grand. I'm like, oh my God, I just lost them $20,000. It is you know, a different feel. I mean, it, if you've been a money manager, they, people feel the same way. It's easier to take losses with your own money than others, um, especially if you, you know, you have uh, some type of moral compass. I mean, some people it doesn't bother at all. I, yeah, I guess okay, for some people know. it doesn't matter, but for me, yeah. it, it matters. And 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 like I, I I was saying, the guys at Gellos, I mean, they are the they're your friends, most, most down to earth. You know, you you can you see you might see them on their social media platforms and think whoever you know and whatever you want about whoever they are. 
because I'm not going to get into specifics, but they are really probably the best, most savvy traders you're ever going to come across, you know, ever. And so I enjoyed, really enjoyed my time with them. But like I said, I haven't, I haven't, I didn't sleep for years. I mean, year, years. And my wife, um, when um, a few weeks ago, when I, you know, we'd been talking about it, like, cause last year, if you guys re recall, like the week ahead videos, um, you know, towards the end of the last year, you probably heard me say, you know, 2020 was trash. I mean, other than the, the COVID spike, yeah, I made some money in the COVID spike. And then I spent the rest of 2020 just giving it back. And I, and my 2020 was just spinning my wheels, like, and then spending because the Bloomberg costs would come out of my costs, you know, spending, you know, $2,700 a month on Bloomberg. It's like, it's like, for what, you know, I spent a whole year spinning my wheels for what and losing sleep. And I mean, I was lashing out at my kids, lashing out at my wife, uh, I'll sh although she lashes back, um, you know, it just what, and, and, my health, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm nearing 50 years old. And when uh, my wife and I, we, we discussed this, uh, the, the last, actually, you know, since the beginning of 2021, um, she's like, Blake, that's the best thing that could happen to you health wise. And, you know, she's like, you know, your, your family needs you, you know, forget the money. And, you know, when, when it's, even when it's great, when you're, when you're in, in the, first few years because volatility was so high I mean crushed it but I still didn't sleep and I still I mean I, I would I would be out you know at seven o'clock at night just yawning you know every night and it's brutal and it it is it, it was extremely brutal so for me like you know I just had a great couple of days in in fx the last few days being being short Aussies, long Euro Sterling, long uh, US dollar Norwegian Krona, US dollar Mexican Peso. And guess what? I didn't have to. There's share. your confirmation. <laughs> What's that? There's your confirmation. Yeah. And, and guess, guess what else? I slept. I've been sleeping for the last three weeks. I mean, granted, I can't sleep much longer than, you know, seven hours, but I sleep a full night. I don't worry about it. I don't, I don't get up every moment. And you know, if I ever wanted to trade size, I think I would actually go to a real prop trading firm. This way I don't know who's involved. And then I could really just go for it. You know what I mean? But the, 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 you know, after talking it through with the guys at Gellos, it's like, you know, what, why don't I just make it all? And, you know, I don't have to, cut up the profits and, you know, and we left on really good terms and I, I have nothing but the most awesome things to say about that group, you know, cause it's, it's a, it's a select group of guys, you know, they handpicked their people that are with them and, you know, it was a, it was a good run. And, you know, I think it was just this last year of very low volatility and just spinning my wheels and, you know, it, I had to look around and go, you know, life, life is gone before you know it. And I didn't want to spend any more time in my life with the stress. It's just not worth it to me. And, you know, I'm still trading and I still, and now I trade for myself and now I uh, make it all and I sleep <laughs> and I enjoy it. And uh, yeah, you know, my gains aren't going to be as big as they were you know, but my losses are not going to be as stressful as they were. And that to me is everything. So, uh, you know, I wanted to explain that to you guys because I've been there, you know, uh, the only thing I haven't done is I haven't done what Stelios has done. I haven't worked for a bank. And I, I would think if I was, if I was in my thirties and I didn't have kids, I didn't have a family and I could see why so many young traders are out there and they just go for it. And, and you know, banks find the, the guys and gals that just have the intuition and the ones that will, you know, go balls to the wall and go for it because 
they they have good instincts and they don't have to think about what's you know who's on the other side of that and you know about they don't they're not thinking about they don't have a moral compass if you will because they don't know who they're, they're just trading for the bank yeah I, I think it's a different ball game they don't have to drive their son to soccer practice when they're in a hundred lot position yeah and i've i i, I tell you that that actually has been um you should have seen me like the last five years just driving and on, on having quotes sitting on my dashboard as I'm driving. Like, you know, I, like I sit here and I do this, this is what, uh, this is how it looks. I mean, you know, let me just show you. You put the phone you know, on the speedometer. And I've got, you know, this phone is sitting <laughs> on my, you know, on my dash, like, you know, like pivoted and I'm constantly looking at quotes as I'm driving it's scary oh, and it, you know I've that's like texting close calls and I don't now I just like I don't care not not that I don't care but it's my money so I don't it's not it's not relevant and you know for me having a huge swing is not that big of a deal trading on you know trading the way I trade you know it's like oh ooh, ooh, great ooh, I lost a couple grand who no big deal but you know, when you're trading somebody else's money and you're like, Ooh, I just lost 50 grand. You know, that is a big deal. And it's a big deal when you're, you know, doing it in Asia and stuff starts moving and there's no, there's no liquidity. You know what I mean? So anyway, so coach, those are my experiences and, and it's been a life experience. That's for sure. And a great, you know, one, one, one thing I learned from you, Blake, and I remember interviewing you on FX street and I asked you, I said, well, Blake, are you ever flat? And uh, you said, no, I, I'm always in the market. And, you it's know, not the way I trade, head, man. Yeah, it, you know, reminds me of that saying to be there for the good times. You have to be there all the time. But also in my head, I was going, wow, this guy's really an action junkie. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's, anyway. you know, and that's, it's, and that, that has been, that was also another, I don't want to say it was a challenge, but it definitely was a different way of trading because I always have exposure. I'm always, I've always got something going, um, but magnet, uh, you know, magnet or uh, multiply that by size. So yeah. it's like, I've always got like, let's say I'm, I've always got a dollar long going or I've always got a dollar short going. Well, I might have a few pairs going with, and I'm spread out, you know, with feelers out everywhere, but then multiply that size by like, 10 to 20 then my PL starts swinging right where you know for me like i said if if i'm if i'm you know going to the grocery store but you know trading my own money and you know i, I lose a couple grand i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna freak out but when you're you know you have a PL that might swing 20 or thirty thousand, you know when you're just out and about lollygagging around you know <laughs> it, it, it does uh it, it, it affects on your psyche, right? I think that we all respect um, the choices. And I think four years of doing something, um, you're not, it wasn't a rash decision. You went through the process, maybe even longer than, you know, you needed to. You probably started thinking about this a year or so ago. And um, Money comes and goes. Pips come and go. And like you said, Blake, uh, I, yeah, I know you think you're getting old because you're almost 50. You're really a young man. Uh, but time has gone forever um, to make it count. It's really our most valuable currency. And I saw one uh, someone mention that, um, you know, you're, you're a family man. And uh, I, I know that was probably tearing at you not to be able to give your family as much attention because you're always looking at your positions. And, uh, you know, I congratulate people that go for the quality of life instead of uh, just accumulating material wealth. And that's that, that, you know, it's, it's interesting you say that Dale, as you get older um, and, you know, like, you know, I've, I'd like to believe I've got plenty of years ahead of me, but I've also seen, I, I've actually, I've known people my age that have left this earth too early for no reason. And I know that I'm on the 
other side of the hill at this point in my life. Um, probably based on my earlier years of lifestyle. So I don't, I don't plan, I don't think I'm going to make it to a hundred because I don't live a lifestyle like Steve does where he only eats grapes and doesn't drink alcohol. Um, I'm just kidding, Steve, if you're listening. You'll make, you'll make it. But, but I, but I, but I, but what I'm saying, grapes, unfortunately, isn't. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that I, I, I'm, but for the, for the latter part of my life, I don't want to live the way I've just lived the last four years. And like I said, good or bad, I had some great years. I mean, you know, the first few years that I traded with Gellos, man, or, you know, with, you know, this group, basically, man, they were knocked down, drag out, awesome years. I, but I don't think I'd want that back. I really wouldn't. I'd, I'd really rather have my time with my kids back. You know, we're also approaching another four year mark. Do you know what it is? Yeah, four years with Forex Analytics. Yeah, <laughs> and face. Okay, so yeah. four years. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're glad that uh, I, uh, you know, you can pour your heart out into this and it doesn't stress you out like you used, you used know, to, and, uh, like, and, and, uh, and, I'll, and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you from a Forex analytics standpoint, then I want to turn it over to Stelios. Um, there are a lot of projects that I've put on the back burner with Forex analytics uh, for years. I've been, I, I remember and, th and that's, I don't have the capacity as a human being to do like, for example, when I was with MB Trading or Ally Financial, um, we had videos of how to how to do how to like trade using Fibonacci's. Uh, I've been promising the Forex Analytics community literally for four years that I'm going to make this video. Um, and I and 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 by the way, I, I'm I'm putting together the PowerPoint now, just so you guys know. Uh, <laughs> I I seriously, I've been promising for four years. But who has the, I don't have the capacity after literally sitting in this computer, like I sit in this desk and it's, it looks, some of you have seen my desk because I've tweeted out pictures years ago, you know, it's like a big horseshoe and I would like sit here for, for 16 hours a day. I don't move. My butt hurts. I have a, I have a big pillow underneath my, my, uh, my chair, but I mean, I like literally sit here for 16 hours a day and for me to actually take the time to build a five hour video when it's not me building out five hours, it's actually the production value of actually building it and, you know, kind of making sure I've got it right, do over, do over filming to do that on a weekend or after sitting around for 15 hours, 16 hours of trading and then trying to be a husband and dad and eat and, you know, sleep. It's just been impossible. So there's like a lot of little things like that with Forex analytics I've been planning to do, but now I will do. I've got time to do it and I feel good. It's like, and I can actually, like I can actually film a video right now. Like if it were me just trading, like, you know, in the North American session uh, and it's, you know, Europe goes home and I, and I'm sitting here, I spend the next four hours just filming a video and my P and L goes up and down, you know, a few grand it doesn't bother me that doesn't bother me but you know i don't have to micromanage my positions but when you trade size in somebody else's money <laughs> it's like you know i'm like this the whole time i'm watching every tick for like the next 15 hours, and that's just how it is so i'm really excited that there are things that i've been wanting to do for forex analytics for our community that i'll be able to do and um, you know, and, and believe me, I've got a lot of skills about risk management that I didn't have five years ago. And yeah, uh, I there you go. Share, I can't wait to share all that with you guys and kind of how I've, you know, tailored some of my trading around that. But, you know, we're going to be, we're, we're going to talk a lot about that in the, in the, in the months and years to come. So anyway, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to stop there, but, uh, I, I just wanted to share my experiences because a lot of people have this grandiose and, and I have to stop with one last thing. I'm sorry, Stelios, but we can go for, for a while. Right. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I gotta say one, one last thing. Um, and excuse my hair. This is 
straight out of bed and it's, you know, four, three, four, five o'clock in the morning here. Um, a lot of traders have this grandiose idea like, um, oh, I'm going to start with uh, 5,000 US dollars and I'm going to turn that into 10 and then 10 into 30 and 30 into 100 and then 100 into a million and a million into 10 million. And they have this, you know, grandiose like, you know, idea in their head that that's, it just works that way. Um, what, what do they call it when, um, 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 excuse me, because it's early in the morning um, and I'm lost for words. The, uh, the idea that you're just going to continue to, to, to plow money in and you're going to be able to just grow Martin that money. Gale. What's that? Martin Gale. No, 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 not that. Um, it's uh yeah delusions of grandeur but but no it's the um it's the uh the idea that you, you you're just going to continuously uh let your money um exponentially grow in that fashion but i'm going to tell you that every person and i gotta i gotta say this every person has a point and it probably is more based on your pedigree um perception than anything okay you have a point where too big is uh, there. There's there's too much. It's too big, and it probably has, like I said, more to do with your, you know, upbringing. Upbringing, you know, where you know, like I, I'm a, I come from a middle class family. You know, I don't. You, you guys, I don't. My 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 dad is a um, a uh, you know he he worked for the city of Tempe for thirty years. You know, my mom is a computer programmer. You know, uh, and not not a you know not a you know you know not like a high tech one either but i come from a middle class family so you know for me you know, a certain amount of money is a, is is a lot you know i don't come from you know i i, I didn't come from a, a family of multimillionaires and thinks that you know like oh i you know i i piss 50,000 dollars away you know on a weekend it's no big deal that's not me and that's not where i come from so you know when you get to a certain amount there are certain levels that it really starts to affect you mentally. And I've worked my way up to where, you know, I don't, I don't think about money the way that a lot of people that I know do, but it still is, there's a point where you, you reach where it's like, okay, that's a lot, you know, making and losing, you know, where the swings become too much. Yeah, you can train relative. yourself to a certain extent, but there is a certain point where you're like, whoa, that was a really big, that was a, a lot, you know what I mean? And and so I like to explain that to people because I've reached those thresholds in my career on multiple occasions where I trade large enough to where I'm like, okay. And then I, you know, I'm calculating in my own head how much that cost or was or how much I made or lost. And that becomes a lot to me. And that's where I start really, you know, you, it's it's hard to focus because it's like oh my god I just lost fifty grand. Oh, with that fifty thousand dollars I could have uh, actually you know um, bought new roofing for my entire house, you know, or something like that. You start thinking like that, but there are there are limitations to most people, and that's why you know those you know you have to you have to be at points where you you know where your limits are at and know how to pare back and you know take profits off and you know pull profits out of your account. But those are all, you know, conversations that we'll have in the next, you know, six months to a year. But, I, but it, is, it is important to understand that because I think everybody does have different thresholds based on your upbringing and where you came from and your pedigree. So with that being said, the star of the show will be actually Stelios because- Not sure about that. <laughs> okay, so uh, Stel? Yes. Um, would you like to- uh, talk about your experience the way Blake did, or would you prefer to uh, have me oh, we'll do a bit, guide you around? I think we'll do, we'll do a bit of both. Um, okay. So All right, well, why don't, we, why don't we just start it off with, uh, I, I know a little bit about your background. Uh, it came with the book, yeah. 
And uh, I'm interested in maybe the first couple steps before you ended up at Merrill's desk trading LIBOR, what you were doing. I know you had a master's, so uh, tell us about uh, what you were trying to accomplish getting a master's degree in the first place. (laughs) <laughs> so this I describe all this in the book as well. So it's it's a good thing for people to understand where I come from because then you get taken into a trip, which can, which is quite scary at times. But uh, basically, to summarize, I um, uh, I studied computer science, so I became a programmer. I did uh, hardcore programming for about three years uh, here in Greece. Then I worked for Accenture. Uh, on a on a project for a bank where they redesigned their system. This was all programming and you know project okay. management stuff like that. But then I got bored. I got really bored. So I decided, uh, following advice from my family, to do an MBA, which is I think is a great way to change career or to open doors. I think MBAs have nothing to do about what you learn. It's about your networking. And um, I did that. So I studied in the UK. I did in London at the Imperial College. I did my MBA at Manchester Business School and on the first term of the MBA we had just started um, it was this was in 2000 so these were the good days and uh, we had consultancies banks everybody coming to our, the campus and giving presentations and this guy one of the first presentations there was this relatively boring guy talking about banking and uh, then I realized he's a trader and he starts talking about what he does on a day-to-day basis and I was just hooked. So this was a guy from Barclays and um, I applied for an internship, uh, summer internship uh, at Barclays and to a few other banks. Barclays, um, they did this amazing um, three-day weekend where they took you to their headquarters in Canary Wharf. They actually selected people, you know, you did these tests and mathematics tests and English and interviews and then they pick 200 people out of the, I don't know how many thousands applied. And they take them for a three-day weekend, and they do these games and uh, and uh, tests and stuff. It was really, really amazing. I mean, really well organized. And you play these games, and you don't realize it, but you get being you being watched and you're being um, uh, assessed. Right. And uh, I was lucky enough. They picked in the end, I think, forty people to do an internship, and I was uh, lucky enough to do well on that uh, that three-day weekend. And they they picked me. So what was the internship I, like? Uh, what did what were your uh, what did they teach you? What were your duties as an intern at Barclays? Yes, well, that's the thing. I got I went into the internship. It was twelve week internship, and uh, I I got in thinking, okay, I have to learn things. I have to do this and that. And really, <laughs> at the end of the internship, when I or near the end, when I asked one of the managers, I said, you know, what are you looking for in a guy that you want to hire? He turns around to me and he goes. We're looking for people who are not assholes. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what the hell? But um, seriously, no, they, they, the whole point of the internship is to, is to see how you interact, how you assimilate new information. Because let's not forget, I was an IT man. I, was, I had traded as an as a average Joe, you know, a retail trader. I had done some trading here in Greece, but really nothing compared to being a professional trader or, or trading full time. So... I wasn't expected to know about trading and finance and everything, but they were, they gave me this project, which was about the, um, the guilt basis. So this is a, a, a complex, pro- relatively complex project, product that, that's traded. Um, and, um, but really the, co- the whole point was to see how I adapt to the environment, how I adapt to what's required of me. And, um, and uh, you know how I interact with everybody, and you know what kind of person I am. So uh, I was lucky enough. I worked with this guy. We became friends afterwards, uh, called Trevor, and uh, I worked with him on this project. And uh, it's uh, it was really good. And in the end, I had to write up a report for the business school, and one for the bank. But the bank didn't care about the report. I'm sure they just threw it away. It was a, it was about finding out who I am and how I work and how my brain works. So um, that was the internship. Um, okay. And then I went back to business school and I had another eight months or so to go. But after the internship, they made me the offer. So I was in this great situation where I had more business school, but I didn't care about what I do because I had the job ready. Um, you know, and as it turns out, usually in these situations, I had no pressure. So I did really well. I got a distinction, you know, I did very well at the MBA as well. So um, it, was, uh, it was enjoyable. And then early 2002, I landed in Canary Wharf and I started uh, trading 
well, learning to trade at Barclays. And I was, I was lucky enough that in one of those tasks that was uh, one of those games that we played in that assessment weekend, the supervisor was the head of the Sterling interest rates derivatives desk. Really smart guy. And um, he basically made me an offer to go to his desk when I finished my MBA, which was the Sterling desk. And uh, so when I started, I went there and I spent the first year or so, a uh, year and a half, because I had all these, um, all this experience in coding and Excel and Visual Basic, I knew everything. This guy said, oh, wow, okay, this guy is going to come and learn to be a trader. But first, he's going to redesign all the pricing models and do this and that. So I spent like nearly, I think, a year and a half um, doing systems as well as learning to trade, which was difficult because, you know, I wanted to trade, but I had all these, all these projects I have to um, deliver. And, but the good part was that I learned about every instrument. I learned about how um, swaps work and, you know, discounted cash flows and, uh, and PVs and everything. So it was really, really good for me to understand the product because you have traders who trade something and they don't actually understand the mechanics. They see a price and, and it happens. Right. You know, a lot of people know the product, but some people just don't, don't care. They see a price, they see a chart, they trade that. So, right. So that's what I, I spent uh, doing uh, the first year and a half. Then they gave me a little trading book to trade and uh, I did well. And uh, that's when the whole story started. So okay. I, I, wa I want to ask a question. What do, you, what do people know about the LIBOR scandal? Let's say, what, do, what, what have you heard about it, Dale? Do you know, do you know what it was? Uh, uh, that, you know, banks were... Uh misquoting it or manipulating the spread to yes. um and people ended up the you know the rationale was that yep. it was costing people money on their loans because of the uh, price fixing or manipulation of the rate yes so this is what the media said and um right. uh, ob obviously we know media is guided and they they presented something which was True in one little part and untrue in a massive part. So, what? And one of our attendees said that it was all your fault. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, so, so what happened is this. Um, where do I start? Okay. So, in terms to put a timeline, I some things happened when I was at Barclays in my first two three years, and then I got a phone call in two thousand ten from a lawyer saying, you know, there's this investigation. This is years later. There's this investigation about LIBOR and you're one of, you know, 300 people we want to talk to. I'm like, okay, yeah, of course I'll help and this and that. And what now, what happened? And the stuff that I write and I say, he's all public domain. I'm not saying anything new. It's just that it got reported very little because they, obviously everybody uh, high up wanted to bury this. Um, so I put everything together and I want people to understand what happened. And also through this book, I want, to, I want people to step in my shoes and see how it went, see how the thing progressed and try to ask yourself, what would I do in Stelius' shoes? What would I do here? What would I do there? Because it's a very difficult journey. So what happened is this. When I first started, and I'm not going to give everything away, but I'm going to give you a, a good idea. When I first started, um, you had, I worked on the desk that traded LIBOR swaps, among others. And LIBOR, for people who don't know, is the rate at which banks can borrow money. And it's a, it's a rate that banks can borrow money from each other and it's a specific um, panel of banks who submit their LIBOR rates for various maturities. So one week, one month, two months, three months, up to one year. And the definition of LIBOR is where would you be able to borrow normal market size in three months or six months or whatever. That was the definition of LIBOR. By the way, nobody knew the definition. I asked somebody in, afterwards, uh, people who, was, who has been trading LIBOR swaps for years, you know, what do you know what the definition is? No, I don't know. No, nobody cared about it. But anyway, um, so that's the definition. So if you're a bank, if you are Barclays, and you ask, where do I borrow three-month uh, funds in, say, dollars in normal market size, so in a billion dollars, you will get, if you ask 10 banks, you will get five different numbers. It, it just goes without saying, if you ask JP Morgan, or if you ask Banca Intesa, or you know, whatever bank, you'll get different numbers. Um, so on any given day, the, the person, there's one person in each bank who submits this LIBOR rate. And he says, for one month or for three months or six months, Barclays can borrow 
X percent, you know, 1.03 percent. This person will have got 1.01, 1.02, 1.05, 1.04, whatever. They pick one number. There is no, or there was no um, guideline as to how to do it. So when I first started in the bank, one of the first things that my boss told me, he took me by the hand and he took me to the, the desk of the submitter who was like 10 meters away, three rows away. And he said, no, this is uh, Peter. He submits uh, LIBORs for this bank. And on occasion, I'm going to ask you to tell him what our preference is because you, know, you have a position. This guy is, as well, the submitter, they have, they have huge positions. So you will naturally have based on any given day what position you have. You want it to be a little bit higher. You want it to be a little bit lower. Uh, my boss told me that because he, at the time he was in New York. I was in London and LIBOR sets at 11 a.m. London time. So New York guys are asleep at the time. So uh, he said, he told me that. And, you know, it was all in the open. And uh, this was something that I found out afterwards had been gone on for years and decades. So basically you have a day when the swaps desk or their submitter himself or whoever has a huge fixing position, huge position on film of LIBOR that day. Um, and he wants the rate to be higher. Well, if he can choose between 102, 1.03, and 1.04, he's going to go with 1.04. It's commercial interest. Um, and that is what was happening, what my bosses were telling me to tell the other guy. And sometimes it was done over email. In the beginning, it was done over email. Then it was done over voice. Uh, actually, no, in the beginning, it was done over voice, then over email, etc. And that's what happened. And, you know, as I mean, far as I was... It wasn't that just kind of like the spread for the bank to take as a profit center. Yeah, exactly. It's commercial interest. And from yeah. what I know, there was no rule or law or regulation that prohibited that. Later on in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a court that said, this is not allowed. You're not allowed to do that. And then obviously after that date, nobody did that. But before that, and for decades from what I understood afterwards, it was done and it was very regular. So that happened for years and years, and it nudged, it could nudge your, uh, the final LIBOR number a little bit because the, the calculation is there are 16 banks who submit LIBOR rates. Top four get taken out, bottom four get taken out, and the rest are averaged. So if you're, you put a stupid number, you just get taken out. You don't go into the calculation. So that was a, a nice way for them to smooth out uh, the, the outliers and, uh, and put a rate that's kind of representative. So anyway, this happened for years and years, and theoretically, you could influence LIBOR like this. You could buy, say, an eighth of a base point. You know, if you're one bank and you do that, you could influence. And if you had a huge enough position, you could you know, move it a little bit to your advantage and make a little bit of money. And in court, we actually proved how much that money was. And when I tell you, you're going to laugh. Um, anyway, that's what happened. Fast forward to 2008, when the crisis started and rates, LIBOR rates, uh, we're at point, let's say X, no, you know, 5%, three months, the dollar LIBOR is 5% or 4%. And then suddenly we see things happening with Bear Stearns and Lehman. And suddenly when you're lending out money, so when somebody's borrowing for you at LIBOR, you don't really start caring about the rate. You don't care if you're going to get 4% back. You care if you're going to get your money back at the end right. because they might borrow and then go bust. So right. what happened? Central banks start slashing rates and LIBORs theoretically are linked to interest rates, to the Fed funds rate, but they stopped being linked. They started going up, even though as they, were, they were slashing rates because banks were scared that they're not gonna get their money back. So LIBORs were going up. I was working at Merrill at the time. I had positions that would make money because I could see it coming. I had positions that would make money if LIBOR goes up. And so did hedge funds. Many of the, the smart guys, I mean, they had put huge positions on and they made crap loads of money. 2008 was my best year. 2009 as well was really good. And they made lots of money. And then suddenly it was in, I think it was early 2009. From one day to the next, uh, LIBOR, three month dollar LIBOR moved. Usually it would move by like a base point or half a base point, a quarter of a base point. It would never gap unless there's something massive that happens. So one day from the next, but from one day to the next, three month dollar LIBOR with nothing changed in the markets, no rate cuts, no rate hikes, nothing. It goes from like, I can't remember the numbers exactly, from like 6% to 5%, which is 100 base points. It was ridiculous. I, I remember looking at the screens and going, what the hell just happened? Somebody mistyped it. It has to be a fat finger. And it wasn't. So LIBOR started moving by such a month. And the next day, it moved another 50 base points. And I'm like, what the hell is happening? And obviously, people made a lot of money and people lost a lot of money. 
and the, the smart people, the hedge funds and all that, who had positions where LIBOR would be high, they started losing a lot of money. And uh, I guess somebody went to the regulator and said, look, something's wrong here. You've got to go check it out. And um, from what I understand, an investigation started and they found out what happened. And this is something that the guy from, um, I'm going to put the link here actually afterwards. There was a, uh, an episode of BBC Panorama. So the BBC in the UK, there's this journalist, Andy Verity, who's such an amazing guy. And he wanted to tell the truth. And he's the only one who did. So he made a video about this. And um, he showed that there was um, orders from the Chancellor of the Exchequer, or basically very high up, Bank of England, who said to the banks, guys, you have to lower your LIBOR submissions because if you don't, it shows that you have problem raising cash. You might go under, you know, there might be a run on the bank. There's going to be trouble. You have to lower your submission. Now, this obviously is illegal. You know, you can't go 100 base points lower. You have to have the, you know, the, 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 the rate that you said has to be, you know, representative of where you can borrow money. And um, so I found out later, I didn't know at the time, I found out in court that uh, uh, the Bank of England uh, had given orders to the CEOs, bring your libraries down. And uh, that's what they did. And suddenly people start asking questions, obviously, and there's an investigation and they find this and they see how far, how high up it goes. And it goes to the CEOs and then it goes to the Bank of England and it goes all the way up. So I'm guessing they panicked, the regulators and the people who are supposed to investigate this because let's face it, you don't go after the big boys uh, if you want to live anyway. <laughs> and um, uh, what, then they, what they did then is they investigated more and they go back all these years and they find out these uh, requests that I was passing on for my bosses, by the way, which were on email, so recorded, and I, know, I knew everything was recorded, and they go back to that. And they go, oh, this is illegal. Why are you doing this? This is why we're going to prosecute you. And that's how I found out that I was being investigated and then prosecuted for that. And my legal team, they just couldn't believe it. They're like, what the hell is happening? First of all, I was the guy who was, I was receiving an email saying, can you please tell X, Y, Z that we prefer to be high? I forwarded that email or I wrote a market commentary sometimes and I wrote that at the end. And they go after me and not the boss, first of all, <laughs> which is insane. Uh, the boss is still out there working and they obviously untouched. Um, so they go after me and people of my level you know, mostly juniors. And uh, if you remember, this was my first trading job. I was an associate. You know, you start as at the, at the very bottom. Um, and that's what happened. And then starts a six and a half legal process, which six and a half is years. something that can... Six and a half, sorry, what did I say? Yeah, six, six and, and a half, half years, half. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. All yeah. right. And it's something, yeah, that can break you. Absolutely. Yeah. Was your mistake so, uh, the first time going to that lawyer to cooperate, not having a lawyer with you? Because you, did, you uh, felt like you a, did nothing wrong? Yeah, well, I, I went without a lawyer because I said, no, I want to help. Obviously, there, it right. was not a mistake. They, I, I didn't say anything or do anything that, okay. you know, that hurt me. Um, uh, but, uh, I, you know, I think they were pretty well determined on uh, who they were going to go after. Um, but as it turned out... I had to go through a six plus year process because, you know, they go, they say, we, you know, we're investigating you. Then they go, we're going to prosecute you. By the way, the trial is in two years. Uh, and you have to go through all this knowing that this is pending above your head. You know, I was facing 10 years in prison for this. You, you know, um, um, Stelios, yeah. can I say something? Yeah. So when I first met Stelios, um, you know, uh, Steve, Steve, Steve uh, knew him, uh, or you guys, you guys met previous, obviously, to to us uh, um, yeah. starting Forex Analytics, and 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 I was just putting together the ideas, and I was still trading for um, for uh, you know, or working for uh, MB Trade. Wise, wise uh, trade, wise trade. No, we we or we were already done with them years oh. before that. But um, I was, tra you know, I was working for them, and and we and they they were allowing me to build um, forex analytics. Um, you know, as we made this transition, and I talked to Stelios, and he's like, "Yeah, I want to be part of it, but you you got to know, 
Uh, mm-hmm. you, you, you've heard about this on the news. Well, that's me. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> and I remember, <laughs> but I, but there were so many years for the first couple of years, Stelios. I mean, he was really stressed out and I mean, yeah. rightfully so. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's uh, when you have this thing above your head and you know, the, the problem is that this, when it goes to court, and you have all these, uh, you know, the barristers and you get cross-examined by the barristers and all that. You know, I, obviously I speak English quite well, but it's not my mother language, so mother tongue. So it's like you get on the spot there. And I, I always said, even if I brought my grandmother there who had nothing to do with it, she would still be, you know, bloody scared, you know. So it was, it was stressful. It was really stressful. Well, but I'm I, gonna, I guess... I'm... I, 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 I want to say that I'm getting um, confirmations from a lot of different people that they're they're getting your book, and um, I, I just I'm, you, I'm excited to actually read it and 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 get my I want I'm gonna I already ordered a copy, but I I can't wait to get my signed copy. So, so uh, you were, still, uh, you know, going through that type of crisis for that long a period of time, I mean, you know, people have health crises or, you know, they, you know, once you're in the system, uh, it grinds so slowly. Um, tell us, uh, uh, what happened to you personally and how you were able to cope and at times how you felt, um, that you couldn't cope and, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, we met you while you were still going through this and I had no idea because of the way you, you know, comport yourself with others and so i I know that um you know it's not in a just a it's not just a legal thing it's a you talk about six and a half years it's like um um you were in a war i mean do you have any uh, ptsd from that and uh worry about the fact that you know i you know a lot of people that have had trouble with regulators give up every license possible uh like me (laughs) <laughs> I didn't have trouble, but you know, it's, it's nice not to be licensed and regulated and cause you could say what you want to say. Uh, what, uh, what held you up and kept you going through this whole thing? Very good question. Well, the first reaction I had and my wife and my family was despair. You know, the first two days we didn't sleep. When I got yeah. charged, I mean, when, we, when I was being investigated, I always thought, you know, there's no way any, any sane person who saw me in this whole thing would say this person has done nothing. But um, when I got charged, I, I couldn't sleep for two days and my wife neither. And she was pregnant to our second baby. And uh, I, after two days, we just sat there and we said, look, we're not going to let this harm us, no matter what it is. So what do we do? We look at the monster in the face. What are we facing? You know, 10 years in prison. Okay, which means that you do serve the ha- half of it and it's not going to be the maximum. So, you do- so basically, we, we, we agreed that it's going to be two years if I get convicted for whatever reason. So then you start from there and you go, okay, this is the worst case scenario. Um, if that happens, then she said, I'm going to take the kids and, you know, my brother lives in London. So we'll come to UK. I'll work from there. We'll figure it out. And suddenly when you do that, things look a little bit easier. Obviously, you don't want to spend a single day in jail, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> but... When you do that, suddenly a lot of the weight comes off. And then the biggest help for me was the, the Your family. We, my family, yeah. My wife was solid as a rock. My wow. parents, my brother, my friends. A lot of my friends, um, uh, they just uh, deserted me. You know, they just stopped uh, having contact with me, even though they kind of knew the story. Others didn't, and they, they, they stopped um, contact anyway. So, so you, found out who to... your, you found out who your true friends were. Of course, of course. Yeah. So that's, um, you know, that's what I did. And it's something that I try to put across in the book. The book is not just about, oh, what's libel, what was happening, what was right, what was wrong. It's about the whole journey. So I try to, to show that as well, because I think my experience could help others. I, I hope nobody, beca- you know, nobody goes into my situation because it was really difficult at times. But, uh, you know, if you take things one step, one task at a time, one day at a time, you will get there. You'll get there. And obviously it's difficult if you know you've done nothing wrong. It's very difficult to keep fighting and to, to you know, have the energy and yes, you know, I'm going to try more. And trust me, I had how many hours of 
uh, meeting with my lawyers and this and that. And they were trying to explain to me all the legal implications and this, if you do that. And I don't understand many of them, uh, but still I had to make decisions. We together had to make decisions on how to, how to overcome. And I have to say at this point, I always thought lawyers were overpaid. My lead barrister got paid ridiculous amounts of money. And I think, I think he deserved every penny. Um, wow. Anyway. All right. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, all right. So uh, you knew that, uh, you know, you were probably, what, kryptonite in the banking industry to find uh, new employment. And, you know, you talk about yeah. what you had to pay in legal fees. So you, you still needed to um, work and support your family through these times. Uh, what kind, what was that like still having to almost like reinvent yourself from a bank trader to, um, you know, just uh, becoming an entrepreneur? Uh, were you yeah. employed at the time or did you have to, uh, you know, forced into being a self-employed guy after that? Well, first of all, I, I want to show this. We all, all dream about being on the headlines, right? I, I want to be famous. Yeah. So, well, this is, this is the other guy. This is me. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, to answer your question, unfortunately, even though I got cleared, you know, it was a 12-week trial and the verdict came within you know, an hour, which is ridiculous. Um, even though I was cleared completely, and I still have, and I had, and I have um, lots of friends in the industry and who worked at banks, and, uh, you know, I know a lot of people. Uh, everybody said to me, look, there's no way anybody's going to hire you. You're tainted now. Even though you're clear everything, there's nobody who can, who can hire you. I have a very, very good friend who was head of rates in uh, one of the big banks. And, you know, we played pool together. He's a very good friend of mine. And I said, uh, you know, what do you think? And he goes, oh, there's no way. So I had to, uh, unfortunately, leave banking. Actually, as it turns out, fortunately, um, because we, we came back to Greece with my wife and uh, started a family. I raised my kids at home. My wife works. And um, I was lucky enough that I come from a family which is, uh, my father was a banker on the retail side. And we're, you know, we, he's, uh, he's not poor, let's put it that way. He has some assets and he has some funds that I trade for him. So I got back into trading, trading the family money. And um, in yeah. parallel, after meeting Steve and then meeting Blake, we started uh, Forex Analytics. Actually, we, I was working on Forex Analytics before the site went up and before we were ready. Um, uh, through the trial, so I was I would go to the I would go to the um, uh, courthouse at uh, nine o'clock, leave at uh, four thirty, go at, go at home at five, and work until midnight on Forex Analytics. And it actually kept me busy, kept me sane. It was actually a really good thing. And um, so I had to make a, a, a change in my career. I went. Uh, I, I I continued trading because I love it and I, it's what I know how to do. Uh, but I had to trade for my own money and my family money. And uh, it was um, a lot less stressful, uh, a lot less money, obviously. I didn't make the amounts that I made uh, when at the bank. But, um, you know, it's part of life. You, it's a compromise. You know, but isn't besides it, your... Isn't it uh, better? <laughs> Sorry? Isn't it better? <laughs> I'm telling you. Oh, oh. It's, it's miles better. And the stress, I don't have any stress at all. And I, as I said before, I've raised my kids myself, which is, my father keeps telling me, you're the luckiest man in the world. That this yeah, you've got to be there to watch them grow yeah. up. You know, yeah. Stel, uh, one theme that comes through to me after listening to your story is how fortunate you are and were to have a good woman for your wife that stood by you through everything and, uh, you know, went to work, uh, you know, and you were Mr. Mom for a while. And, uh, yeah. you know, that that is worth a billion dollars. And uh, yes. that's, you know, uh, uh, I think a lot of men out here are, are probably, you know, saying, boy, I wish my wife would have done that. I wish my wife would have stood by me like that through a crisis. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd say most of the guys I know here at Forex Analytics are really blessed with great families. And it shows you how important a, a family is. And we're 
we're learning about that again through COVID. And um, I have to say that if I didn't know you were an author and it's great to have an author uh, among the team and uh, I'm going to order the book, but I, I would prefer an autograph copy. Um, You'll get your autograph copy. Yeah. Uh, all right. <laughs> um, that a lot of people that go through things like you went through end up coming out pretty bitter and a chip on their shoulder and uh you know your upbringing uh, uh your parents did a great job because uh, i never would have known you went through a crisis like this <laughs> unless you had told me don't you agree blake well 100 percent. it's these are the the challenges in life that actually define you as a human being and that's why you know, I, like, you know, not to take away from your story, but like I think about my military experience, I forget all of the bad things. Um, and I remember only the good. And like for the my trading over the last, um, you know, four plus years with with who I've just, you know, finished trading with. I remember all the good times and yeah, I'm going to forget all the sleepless nights that I've had. You know what I mean? It's it, it, yeah. but, but that's that's what defines you as a human. And still, as you are definitely you know, I mean, I, I've, I've watched you for the last five years and it's been amazing just to watch. And yeah, you look younger now than you did in your uh, picture when you were acquitted. <laughs> yeah. All well. right. So, you know, anyway, you look better now. <laughs> anyway, but, but, what a great really, day, guys. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say one last thing. Really, if you're psychologically solid and that comes from yourself and also from the people around you, nothing can break you. We even said that at the end, you know, with my wife, when, we, when the verdict was about to come out, we, we made preparations. We said, look, if it's a guilty verdict, this is what we're going to do. That's where we're going to go. One, two, three. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's amazing to have people like that close to you. And also, it's amazing to have people like the Forex Analytics team. I'm not just saying it like this. You know, you guys, you guys just, uh, you know, you, you're like my second family who... You know, I interact with every day and who, you know, make me feel like I'm in a normal world again, you know, and things are absolutely fine, which they are, thank God. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I could do it without, um, without you guys. And I said before, I was working through the trial. I think if I would go home and just stare at the ceiling and, and you know, think about things, I would be a lot worse off. So I think that kind of helped me quite a bit. And, did you, and let, did let, you, I was go, just going to say, go. let me, let me add, it's not just, it's not just those of us here at Forex Analytics. It's it's the people in our chat room, yes. all the traders in our chat room. Yes. That's like our second family. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, did you imbibe after the verdict? Did I what? Imbibe, you know, what's, what's have, a couple, uh, have a couple drinks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like we went... about, uh, tell us about that night after I don't you think you needed quitting. a trial for that. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I but it was definitely a celebration. I, 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 dis I described that in the book as well. Uh, we actually, right after the verdict, the, um, the guy from BBC said, look, if the verdict is good, I'm going to wait outside for a few words. I said, of course. So as we exited, I spoke to the camera. It's, it's gone. Actually, if you, if you YouTube, you search BBC Panorama, the big bank fix, you will find it's a half an hour uh, show that... Uh, I'm in it, and uh, and others. And basically, after that, we went to a pub right behind the uh, courtrooms, and uh, we went there with my legal team. My wife came, friends came, and funny enough, in the table, couple of tables further out was a jury, <laughs> and uh, we talked with them as well. And it was uh, it was a lot of fun, um, yeah. But um, it was it was it was a good few days afterwards, and uh, the relief, as you can imagine, was immense. Absolutely. Hello. immense. Say, say, yes. what the, say what the jurors told you. Oh, yeah. When I, when I got out of the... I read this in the book as well. But Steve, I'm not going to give anything else away, okay? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, when, I, when I got out, I talked to the cameras. Then we kept walking with, the, uh, with my two uh, solicitors. And as we were walking, like 30 meters away, I see a few people of the jury, who obviously I can recognize now, you know, having spent 12 weeks with them. And, um, and I'm like, I, I said to the guy, you know, Steve... His name was Steve, actually. You know, what do I do? These are, these are the jurors. Can I speak to them? Because well, you can do whatever the hell you want. And um, so I go yeah. there. And this lady, I get emotional when I say this because it's, it was uh, a great relief. Um, this lady goes, can I shake your hand? I'm like, what? And she goes, yeah, because, you know, we couldn't believe what we were seeing. 
and what we were hearing that they were accusing you of doing and it's clear that you had nothing to do with it and you know there was all these other things happening and you know the the other thing which was crazy is that my my barristers they asked the prosecution okay of course you're doing this um this uh, trial now what about these people who were who dropped libor by 100 base one this was called lowballing so this was the main the main issue they they went after us to cover up the lowballing that's what happened so he, we, the question was what about those guys and the, the answer was oh don't worry we're prosecuting these guys now we're going to go after lowballing afterwards and of course in 2018 they never did in 2018, they announced, oh, this is the end of the LIBOR um, investigation, yeah. and we're not going to do anything else, yeah. which is uh, it's nuts. It just shows the power of the banks. The <laughs> banks control everything, everything. Media, politicians. Uh, uh, the power uh, of money. Everything. Unfortunately. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. but that's how it is. What a, what a great story, Sel, and uh, I hope you sell a million of these. Blake, um, you know, we all love you, and we're glad that you're sleeping. Yes. You know, I'm, Again, I'm, I, okay, I, 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 and, and just so you guys know, I've read all the comments from everybody that's come in, and uh, there, most people are just like, Blake, it's a great decision, and, you know, glad to have you back. Look, I'm happy to be back, and um, I, I'm, I'm really I, – it's been such an experience, and, and I cannot – say enough about my last several years with with Gelos and the the firm just before that and the people that I've worked with they are like by far and not no no offense to you guys but by far the most savviest like people minds in the markets I've ever met and I've learned so much from them which is only a benefit to forex analytics in our community now what I've learned and I've always I've always come to this game thinking I'm going to learn something new every day. But with them, it was like I, I jump leaps and bounds to see what happens in the markets from, from different players and how they, they, they look at things. And, and it, it, it is very eye-opening and it's been great. And I'm just happy to be able to share that experience with the Forex analytics community now. And, um, and it's nice to, to actually be sleeping. And, and, and I want to say uh, Stelios, you know, to have you on the Forex Analytics team has been, you know, uh, such a pleasure for all of us. And to have you as a friend has been, you know, beyond a pleasure. So, uh, and, and I'm just so excited about your book. And I think it's, um, you know, everybody's been, <laughs> I see all these orders, people are showing screenshots of like the pictures they've taken of their, their orders. So, uh, so yeah. I know we're all excited to read. Yeah, if you're in the U.S., Tom Durkin found uh, a link for you guys to go to Broadway books and that ordering online so just oh, roll crap. up the chat you mean we didn't have to pay it like that uh, one last thing i want to add uh, one of our friends is asking what made me write the book halfway through the the, the court the, the the trial i i realized man this is it's happening to me but it's such a great story so i started taking notes and i said if i if i feel like it in the future i might write a book about it i just said it like that and i think it was over a year after the trial ended uh, that I thought, yeah, I might do that. And I started writing and it became such a healing process. I finally got, you know, closure because it's difficult to let go of this thing. And I was writing and I yeah, must have written. It's cathartic. Just, yes, I must have written for like two months straight. I'm not kidding. My wife wouldn't speak to me. She said, I'm just going to let you write. And when you finish, we can talk. So that's why I did it, most of all. And, and I wanted people to to hear the story, hear the truth, first of all, because the media didn't cover it properly. They covered what the banks told them to cover. And, um, and maybe the book will help people deal with whatever situation comes um, uh, in, in the best possible way. So. All right. What a great uh, front way to wrap up the week with uh, an author and uh, a, a trade author slash trader and a trader slash life coach Blake Morrow and we got to hear from Steve and everyone keeps Steve in your thoughts and prayers uh, so we could have him back uh, to interrupt us uh, during the sessions and <laughs> you know I know you guys miss his review of the markets and uh, you know he's he's great uh, discipline technician uh, trader and um, I tell you what, going into your four with you guys, it's the best project I've ever been part of. So, um, well, we're happy to have you here, Dale, with us. So, yeah. thank you so much for, for the interview today. 
Thank you. Okay, good good job, guys. Hey, everyone, have a great weekend. Uh, get prepared with the, uh, you know, looking at the week ahead. It's a great day to subscribe, at least for a trial. And it gives you the weekend to navigate around the site. And uh, you could tell that we wear our hearts on our sleeves because we care about people and we care about what happens to you every day in the markets. And we're doing our best to help you avoid stepping on landmines and trying to point your eye towards opportunities that uh, look compelling to us. So with that being said, and I know that the guys here live it, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Have a great weekend, everybody. And we'll all see you on Monday. Adios. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stealth. Thank you, Blake. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Adios.